Good day, everyone. Welcome to our session this afternoon with and, uh, I hope I'm not garbling your name. Jeff Nisa, is that it? Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, I hate garbling other people's names because mine always gets garbled too. Um, so we are here to hear about Jeff's research in Miming GitHub to identify open source software health and blockchain projects. Um, thank you very much, Jeff, for joining us. Uh, we'll have 15 minutes to hear about your research and then five minutes for question and answer at the end. So if anyone has questions, please hold them till the end. You can then type them in the chat or Q&A section um, or there'll be a chance to unmute your mic and ask as well. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, so Kira, folks, I'm Jeff, and today I'm going to be talking about um, using some open source data that's available via GitHub in order to look at some factors uh, that can contribute to software health, and specifically looking at blockchain projects. So just to get us started here, um, if you recognize any of these logos, then you've probably used some open source software. So we have uh, WordPress here, which uh, powers a number of websites. If you're a graduate student, you've probably used uh, LaTeX or maybe even uh, R or R Studio uh, to process some data. Um, even if you haven't really used any of these products, Apache here powers most of the web that we use today in terms of web servers and uh, things like that. Uh, and behind that, uh, the Penguin here is Linux, and Linux also runs most of the web infrastructure, or any critical systems infrastructure is also run using, uh, using Linux. Um, and of course, we have uh, Android here as well, so a large portion of the cell phone market. Um, I'm specifically interested in blockchain projects, and uh, Bitcoin is the largest uh, and the oldest blockchain project. Uh, so just some context here. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, and right now it's about the 14th largest currency if they were to sort of all be ranked on the same scale. Uh, so it sits at about the same size as the Russian ruble or the Swiss franc right now. And uh, that puts it at about 1 trillion US dollars in value. But the difference between any other currencies and these other um, icons of software is that, uh, you know, Bitcoin is a currency that's open sourced and it's a software protocol. So it's the only one uh, that has that characteristic. Uh, so I'm not just interested in this, I'm interested in uh, the whole blockchain industry. So let's take a moment here to just mention or just ask, why do people contribute to open source projects? This isn't necessarily the focus of my study, but it's good to set the scene here. So generally, open source projects are public. Uh, so anyone can go look at them, and anyone can go contribute to them, uh, and anyone can go copy them as well. So uh, the there's no sort of proprietary uh, copyright issues or walled garden sort of setup uh, for the majority of open source projects. So one reason is trust, meaning that um, uh, a software vendor can publish their code and people can go inspect it. Uh, and from a user's point of view, they can actually look at the software program to see that it does what it's advertised to do. Another one is experimentation. So for example, if uh, you have an app and there's something that that app just doesn't quite do right and you think you could do it better, if the project is open sourced, you can go and you can copy that project and try it out for yourself uh, and maybe even try to improve on that app and get that feature implemented. Another point is about community. And you know, this is kind of like an innate human uh, condition here, um, but it's no different for software as well. Another reason is productivity. Uh, and this is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, the idea is that if, say, you're a project manager or uh, say you run a company, if you let your employees work on some passion projects uh, outside of sort of their day-to-day, -day, uh, then they could learn, have unintended learnings from working on those exterior projects and bring them back to their regular day-to-day. -day. And in the end, overall, that actually can make people uh, more productive if you let them go pursue other interests. Uh, and just one more that I'll mention is that they're permissionless. So you don't need, uh, you know, 
You don't need to sort of get a job at that company to go contribute to the software if it's open source. Uh, and similarly, uh, you're, uh, you don't need to ask anyone else for permission. So, uh, you know, maybe you want to work on a global project. Uh, that, that's fine. There's no limitations in, in that sense. And from history, we know that this works um, because of all the logos that we just saw. So I'm particularly interested in uh, blockchain data. And most of this data uh, can be found on GitHub. So 84% of the top 200 projects, uh, you can go to GitHub and you can look at the projects. Uh, the Git from GitHub is actually an open source versioning control system. Uh, so GitHub itself is kind of like a social network these days where people post code and sort of have online identities. Uh, and underneath that, Git is what's keeping track of all of the activity. So just some numbers about GitHub. Uh, last year, 56 million developers on GitHub and just under 2 billion contributions. And these are some of the metrics that I'm looking at here. So what am I going to do with this data? Here's the big picture. Uh, my hypothesis is that open source data can be mined to determine software health. So we don't necessarily know what health means or what it is, but I'm saying there's enough open source data out there that it's possible to do this. And I'll be looking at the research question that says, well, how can I find these factors that influence health and identify them? So I'm going to grab a number of factors from GitHub, and I'm going to find the ones that specifically influence the health of a project. In order to do this, I'm going to be modifying a framework that looks at analyzing open source data. And then the longer term vision for this particular research question is to be able to create an app such that you can look at some open source data or you can look at an open source repository on GitHub uh, and the app will uh, crunch some numbers and sort of give you a score and say, yep, that looks healthy or maybe these areas could be improved. Here's a look at the specific methodology. So I know there's a lot of words here. Uh, but basically, it begins with extraction of the raw data. So you need something to work with here. Uh, the extraction is going to happen through GH Archive, which just archives all of the activity on GitHub. Alexa is Amazon's web ranking service. So that's a global service, and they rank sort of everything on the web. And CoinMarketCap keeps track of cryptocurrencies and blockchain projects. So that will provide the raw data. And then I need to decide what specific data I'm going to work with. I need to come up with some metrics to be able to analyze. And then I need to have some sort of statistical, um, or I'm going to use some statistical methods in order to validate those models. So if we look at one of the outputs here, number two, structural equation modeling. This is a statistical analysis method that kind of looks like this. And so I'll spend a minute just sort of breaking this apart a little bit. Um, on the left-hand side in the green, we need to decide some variables and then construct a measurement model and then decide if that model uh, is, is acceptable or not. And then in the second half, we'll be doing the same thing using a slightly different model. So let's look at a part of the measurement model. Uh, this is going to demonstrate some of the power of structural equation modeling. So these are data points that I can measure. All of these come from GitHub. So we have the number of commits. This is when someone makes an update, the number of pull requests. So when someone asks uh, in order to have access to that code, uh, the number of comments. So just like comments in social media and the number of authors that are there. So everybody that engages in these activities has an identity. Uh, in, in online identity on GitHub, not necessarily, um, uh, not necessarily a, a human or a personal identity. Um, and so we can pull these. Now, from the researcher's point of view, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, all of these things in my context kind of contribute to the same thing. I'm going to label that thing community engagement. So my X is here are my variables. These are my measurable bits of data. And then my community engagement, this is an unobserved variable. So this is something that I cannot measure. 
you cannot go to GitHub and uh, look at uh, the community engagement. Um, or if you can, you know, the researcher has done their own definition for that. Um, all the measurements have some error terms that get pumped in here too. This bubble here is called a latent factor, and this is one of the benefits of structural equation modeling uh, because uh, it can contain the unobserved variable, in this case, community engagement, um, because you cannot measure it directly. So in a sort of more simple statistical model, you could do a linear regression here, but then you would have to measure community engagement. So this is the entire measurement model with all of my data points. Uh, and we have three factors. So I won't go through all of the possible data points. Um, community engagement, as I've already described. Um, software health or uh, robustness. I'm calling those to be the same thing. So how strong is that software? Uh, and then general public interest is my final uh, latent factor. So at this point here, also these arrows assume that there's no structural relationship between these. And I just want to have a look at the measurement model. So these arrows just allow for any possible relationship between these. So you take your entire measurement model, uh, and if it's valid, you move on to the structural equation part. So the structural model is another one that the researcher builds, and then that also gets assessed. Now, both of these models are just built using the researcher's intuition. Uh, so there's no sort of first principles ground up way to do it. But the researcher, uh, you know, through their literature review, has some idea of what they think should work. And then the statistical analysis is going to say either, yes, that looks OK, uh, or no, perhaps you need to make some modifications. Uh, both of the analysis uh, in terms of both models are going to be done using Levon, which is an, a package for R. Uh, both are open source. Um, those of you at AUT may be using uh, AMOS for SPSS as well, um, but that is licensed software. Okay, so the, the proposed structural model here uh, is slightly different than before because now we have these directional relationships. So my, uh, I have some arrows here. So this is saying uh, that really when we look at engagement, well, what this is going to do uh, is this is going to positively influence health. And similarly, I'm hypothesizing that public interest also positively influences health. Um, I've left out uh, my, I've left out my variables and my error terms just for simplification here. Uh, now in the future. Uh, here I have a, a third hypothesis that I'm, you know, I'm at this point hopeful of, but don't quite know. And I'm going to say that, well, actually, innovation, which is kind of uh, really what I'm after here, uh, I can say innovation now depends on software health. And this is the type of thing that you can do with structural equation modeling. Okay, so let's have a quick look at some preliminary results that I've got along the way. We're looking at here stars on the horizontal. So when you go into GitHub and you see some software, uh, you can look at the Android system and you can give it a, a star. Although actually, I don't think Android is on GitHub. Uh, you can look at Bitcoin, the software, and give it a star. Uh, so that's just like giving it a like. And then on the vertical axis, we have forks. And that is when you want to copy the software and make some modifications or experiment on your own. And so these are highly correlated. We can see here the blue line down the middle. Um, now, this is more of a pre-result because it's been known that stars and forks are correlated. Uh, but now it confirms the relationship for the blockchain projects. So my data points are the top 200 blockchain projects um, that fit this. So that's one bit along the way. Another one is that there's uh, here we have stars again on the horizontal, and we have the global web ranking on the vertical. And this says that there's actually no correlation between these two. Uh, and we can tell by the blue line that is along the bottom here. So one example is this project Cake. At the time I collected this data, it sort of was a viral project. And so it has very high public interest in the web ranking, but it hasn't yet had the developer interest on GitHub. 
Uh, and then just one more that I will talk about. This is one that I made because uh, uh, there was no data available for it. And this looks at geographic dispersion. So these are time zones. So we start at UTC, which is in London, come around down to plus 12, which is New Zealand. And we can build a standard for all of the blockchain projects and then compare it to other projects. So here we can see that Bitcoin looks like it has a lot of activity in the same places as the total industry, uh, except maybe here in the Azores, where there's not many people living, uh, and at plus six in Kazakhstan as well, there's not much activity. Uh, so that can tell us something here. So if we take the standard on the left, we can compare these two projects in the middle and on the right, and we can say, well, which project looks better based on the activity in the time zones and so this project here has activity in Europe and in Asia and in America. Uh, and indeed, Cardano is a longer lasting um, project. Centropy is much newer, doesn't have as much data, and therefore could be more vulnerable. OK, so to wrap up, um, the intention here is to identify areas that are in need of improvement or areas that are successful. So if you're a project or community manager, you can look at a software project and say, well, that looks good. What they're doing is working um, or that space needs help. Uh, additionally, if you're going to contribute to a project, you have a finite number of hours that you can contribute. You know, if you're uh, a volunteer here. And so it would be helpful if you could contribute to successful or innovative projects. And so ultimately, I'm hoping that these predictors can be able to actually see some innovation. Future work is just to automate the data collection uh, and then actually be able to validate uh, you know, or invalidate my models. So this project is partway through. OK, that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your night with us today. Um, open now for questions. So if anyone has questions, you can either type them in the chat Type them in the Q&A or unmute your mic.